If you're just tuning in, listen to the Michael M. Hotep Show on the Empowerment Radio Network. And we were doing a little wrap-up of um, the um, election results last night and then with some other topics. But now we are going to have uh, an esteemed guest and scholar and historian on the show. Now, for those who may not be familiar, for some strange reason, you may not be familiar with Dr. Claude Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson served as a state coordinator of education for Governor Reuben Askew of Florida during the tumultuous years of integration. President Jimmy Carter appointed him to assistant secretary in the U.S. Department of Commerce, where he chaired a commission that funded and directed economic development activities for governors. Uh, he was the executive director of two economic uh, development organizations for the city of Miami, and he was the highest ranking uh, black American on the planning committee for the 1988 Democratic Convention. He awarded 37 percent of the contracts to uh, black Americans, a record that has never been broken at, the, at, at, at this time, at that time. And he is uh, also uh, the owner of two radio stations, uh, the last I heard. So we want to welcome to the Michael M. Hotep show. Dr. Claude Anderson. Hello, my brother. How are you doing today? Uh, good morning, Michael. I'm hanging on for a poor black man. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're better off than I am, so. <laughs> well, we'll see. I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know, brother. Well, look, man, it's, it's always good to talk to you. I remember when you came here uh, in Detroit, because I'm in Detroit, been here 43 years. I remember when you were here at the Robert, Roberts Riverwalk Hotel, the uh, Michigan Black Chamber of Commerce brought you, uh, Ken Harris and, and that group. I think it was late 2012. Uh, right. They brought well, you. Well, well, where are you now, Mike? Are you in Detroit? Unfortunately, yes, sir. You still there, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> I thought you'd be running out of 75 by now. Head south. <laughs> hey, I think about it every day, brother. I think about it every day, especially that we have to deal with another four years of uh, the dictator, Governor Snyder. But, yeah. But, yeah, but see, I, I, I gave them, I, I wrote a plan for them, but they I know. They, to, they told me that I'd do something for black folk was racist. I, brother, I know. We, we could talk about that a little bit, man. And, and I know I know some things that went on and some of the people that sold you out, brother, and one of them is in prison right now. So I don't, uh, I don't, you know, I, I don't shed any tears over that. Well, uh, that's good. <laughs> well, the, the people deserve what they get. Exactly, brother, exactly. And I told people, I told people, I said, look, you do not, I said, look, now, Mike Duggan has some good ideas. I said, but this is all part of the takeover, uh, Mayor Mike Duggan. I said, there's a whole takeover, and there were some senile, uh, for lack of a better term, Negroes, who thought that we needed a white mayor and this was going to do us good and all this stuff. And it's like, you have no idea what's about to happen here. So, Right. Well, Michael, I told him back in the one speech at Wayne State University, I guess, back about 1980. 19 86, 87. Okay. I told him exactly what's going to happen in short. Because one of the things I take a great deal of pride in the fact that most of the predictions I've made since 1970 and all my books and documents, I get the I get the dates and the time and the money mm -hmm. and the issue on the head for 40 years. I haven't missed one of them yet. And I predict that short will go down the toilet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told him that they're going to use five different concepts mm -hmm. not only to wipe out Detroit but to wipe out just about all these major majority black cities in America. Mm -hmm. be, they can use five techniques. One is called metropolitan form of government, other one called regional form of government, other one called uh, called gentrification, the other one they called privatization, and the fifth one is called cool cities, which was dealing strictly with a uh, would bring in homosexuals and gays into the community. What was that last and, uh, one? What was and that I, last one? I wrote down a list of all the, all the major assets that belong to the to the majority black public that will be conveyed over into white hands in City Detroit. I named everything from Cobo Hall, uh, the Riverfront, mm. uh, the Renaissance Center, the City Airport, uh, uh, the Art Institute, the, the history and uh, black history and the short history museums, uh, the golf course, the zoo. Um, I went, and I named every one of them. I had them all on the list, and uh, and they didn't believe it was going to happen. The bridge, the tunnel, the water system, the sewer system, all going to be privatized in the hands of the whites coming from the from the uh, suburbs back into the city. And the new ghettos in America will soon be the suburbs where all these blacks foolishly rushed out of the urban cities to move to the suburbs, and now whites going to double back and come back downtown and take over all these major urban cities. Right. They're not going to take over. It's going to be given to them free. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's happening, brother. Now I got the I got the uh, the first four: metropolitan go form of government, reg regional form of government, gentrification, privatization. What was the fifth one? Called cool cities. 
That's what, that's what they're going to popularize and make politically correct to bring in gays, transsexuals, homosexuals, midgets, handicapped, humpbacks, and lesbians. Right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, well, two main things that I want to talk to you about today. I have been following you and reading about the uh, Black Freedmen Indian Treaty of 1866. I ordered the uh, the lecture that you have. On well, actually ordered three lectures at the same time from your website about two or three months ago, and um, I watched that numerous times. I read the article that you have on uh, HarvestInstitute.org, and been sharing that with people. And, and I'm surprised how many people, even those who study history and African American history, Black history, don't know about this. So tell us about the, if you don't mind, tell us about the Black Freedmen Indian Treaty of 1866 and the fight that you have going on to get it enforced. <laughs> okay, thank you, Michael. And, see, and you're absolutely right. 99% of all blacks in this country, and probably 99% of whites in this country, don't understand what the 1866 Indian Treaties uh, forecast right. and mandated, okay? Right. And, uh, and they think about, uh, and they've set Indians up in a special class. Mm -hmm. Most do not know whether white or black understand that Indians played a major, major role in the enslavement process for black folk in America. Correct. That slavery could not have existed without the full co cooperation of American so called American Indians who who bought into the concepts and every treaty, every treaty going back to the fifteen hundreds, every treaty that white signed, uh, they included special provisions for the American Indians to reward and as an incentive for them to help main, to establish, maintain Slavery and to control blacks, and that started say back in the 15th century, and um, and the major tribes they went after what now they call the civilized tribes, mm -hmm. five civilized tribes, as you know the Cherokee, Choctaw, Seminoles, and Creek Indians. Right. Those Indian tribes were the major tribes. All the other smaller tribes fall underneath them, and um, and all those treaties provided benefits. And what they wanted was to call they wanted them to quit being. Uh, uh, rangers and hunters and become civilized. And that's why they call them civilized, by owning slaves. And they, re they receive rewards for going down and chasing down any runaway black slaves, bringing them back to the master. They received uh, tw uh, $25 for bringing back every runaway slave. And if they couldn't bring him back, they got $20 for just bringing back his scalp with the, it with the, it uh, the ears attached. Right. And when the whole process of scalping started, uh, that process, scalping didn't start with Indians uh, taking white folks' scalps, uh, whites taking Indians' scalps. It started with, with, the Indian, with Indians chasing down blacks and catching them in the woods, and they wouldn't come back and kill them, bring back their scalps. And South Carolina was the first one to initiate that concept. But, they, but, but all the Indians participated in, in the enslavement process to become civilized by owning and controlling slaves themselves. So they owned slaves, they controlled slaves, they chased down slaves, they were slave traders, and all those so-called civilized tribes signed agreements with the Southern Confederacy to maintain slavery because they thought they had so much invested in keeping slavery. And so consequently, by the time the Civil War came up uh, and, and ended, uh, and during that process, the Indians refused to accept anything that went on in the country. With the Emancipation Proclamation, they rejected it. With the 13th Amendment, they rejected it, said blacks, they were, they were sovereign, said they were a part of the United States and kept their slaves. Consequently, after the Civil War ended, that it said most of the tribes still were holding black slaves as slaves. The Choctaw and Chickasaw Indians, for instance, were holding 12 to 15,000 slaves independently and, then, and, and, on the, and on different reservations. Right. And so the United States did at that, that point in time. Right there, Hold that thought right there. we got to take a quick break, okay? Hold okay. We're going to continue another side of the break. You listen to the Michael M. Hotep show on the Empowerment Radio Network, where knowledge is power. Things are getting hot in here. Tell your friends to tune in. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the Michael M. Hotep show on the Empowerment Radio Network, where knowledge is power. Visit us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. We have the information for today's show posted right there. Also on our, uh, also on our Twitter page. Uh, the AHN Show, The AHN Show, or Michael M. Hotel. We have the information there. Now, before the break, we were having a very informative um, discussion with our brother, Dr. Claude Anderson, author of Black Labor, White Wealth, and Poweronomics. You've also seen him in Hidden Colors 2, The Triumph of Melanin. And he was breaking it down to us the Black Freedmen Indian Treaty of 1866. And uh, Dr. Anderson, right before the break, you were talking about how 12,000 to 15,000 um, uh, black slaves yeah, yeah, they still owned, uh, what, 12,000, 15,000 black slaves after slavery ended? And you must learn how to, I'm sorry. 
Oh, go, go ahead. Go, uh, yeah, you, we must, the thing we must focus on becoming self-sufficient, independent by trying to draw in as much wealth power as we can, as quick as we can, into our own communities and learn how to play the game of politics. But the, the, And so those treaties gave us a stepping stone. And in those treaties, what those treaties said very specifically, that, that you Indians must turn, release all your black, your black freedmen and any black Indians right. and, uh, and treat them in all manners similar to the way you treat so-called white Indians. And they put in, in, that, in, those, in those treaties, put so-called Indians into a special protected class. But it also, at the same time, they put those blacks, the black freedmen, those black Indians, into, the, into a protected class. That was a contract with the United States government. It just says the government should do this, or it would, it, would, it would be nice if the government did. It was mandated that they be treated in all manners forever, just like American Indians. And so, and, 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 and to break that down, what those treaties were saying is that black, every black should be black freedmen or black Indians should be given $150 in cash. And the United States government gave like over $207,000 to the Chalkto in this instance to give, give out to the slaves and the black Indians. You must give them $150. You must give them 160 acres of land minimally. You must also treat them in all manners the way Indians are treated. They must also be tax exempt. They must also be able to go to any school without paying a tuition. They must also have access to all resources on a reservation. That means they also should be treated in a, with privileges in a protected class to get things from the federal government without competing for them. Just like they, just like Obama recently gave, uh, been giving, uh, gave out all kind of radio stations and TV licenses to Indians mm -hmm. without they even have to pay for them. They gave them also, uh, licenses to set up, uh, cable systems. And, uh, and, he's, and every year the president has given three and a half billion dollars to so-called white Indians by inviting them to the White House every December. He's invited 567, uh, so-called white Indians into the White House and given them benefits. And that, that and to date has been almost 15 billion dollars. But never once has he invited any of those blacks into the White House and given them anything. And, uh, and that is a violation of the, of the mandates of those treaties. That's why we're in the court system right now fighting, because it is a political issue, it's not a legal issue. It's a political issue. And every and only person in the, in the United States uh, Congressional Black Caucus that's been supporting us has been Maxine Waters. that fully understand it. The rest of your so-called blacks in Congress run and hide in the bathrooms to make sure they don't get involved and say anything about it. And, uh, and even white congressmen have said, like Representative Cohen out of Memphis, Tennessee, said, Dr. Esther, you absolutely, you all should, black folks have been getting these benefits for the last 150 years that have been denied to them. And also in those terms of contracts that in those treaties, in today's terms, black be able to go into any reservation and get access to the timber, the land, the resource, the vault, the silver, the coal, any of those things on the reservation. And they also should have a right now to be able to be federalized, tribalized, and be able to own and, and operate gambling casinos just like just like these, these so-called white Indians. Now, the fact is that 90%, 90% of all the so-called Indians to date are nothing but whites who are passing as Indians. Right. They became they became passable because of the Dawes Commission that went into effect starting in the, in the late 1890s, where the government required that, they, that, that, that agents go all over the United States to every tribe and register Blacks, the Indian individual having black blood, and giving them and the black Indians, and giving them a dog's number, and putting them on the dog's roll, which means an account with the government to get benefits and so much money every year. And uh, and whites found out about it, and what they did then was they they went in there with the dog commissions in many in, in many areas, they paid five dollars to put their name on the roll and to classify them as an Indian when they weren't. That's why almost they probably six percent of all whites in America were claim they got Indian blood, but they don't. They what we call what, what the history books call five dollar Indians. They paid five dollars, their great 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 granddaddy paid five dollars to get on the dog roll and get benefits. That's why between nineteen seventy and nineteen ninety in the United States that the number when we passed the affirmative action program, which I wrote in nineteen seventy for the state of Florida, the number of so called Indians in America went up over three hundred percent in twenty years because they rushed in and got the, and started claiming benefits. And so today we in the court system saying you got we we don't we're not asking for 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 appealing to white conscience to do what they're supposed to do for black folk. All we're asking to do is to obey the law, carry out the law equally. What have you been given to these Indians or so called white Indians or, or original Indians, give them to black folk and, and black the descendants of black Indians just like you do them to the descendants of the whites. Right. Now what the country's been doing for hundred and forty years is rewarding the descendants 
of Indians giving them benefits, unearned benefits, and punishing and ignoring the descendants of the black slaves and the black freemen. And so by 1930, by 1938 and 1939, uh, instead of uh, blacks started to raise some issues about why not they get these benefits, so the so so-called white Indians then went and sent letters from the Indian reservations to the United States Department of Interior, saying how can we exclude these blacks so they would never be able to get any benefits. And they sent this letter in about 1939-1938 to, to the United States Department of Interior. And the United States, and now it's the Bureau of Interior. They referred it to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and it came back later on by 1941 to the Secretary for the Department of Interior. And he said this, that the way you exclude these blacks so they never get any benefits, come up with a public policy in these Indian ranks that says nobody's entitled to benefits unless they can prove they got one quarter Indian blood in them. And that's called a blood, called a blood law. And, um, and, uh, and so, and, and, and they've been using that ever since. Then a quantum of blood, that you got to have a quantum of blood, one quarter, the entire benefits. The treaties never talked about any quantum of blood. So all these so-called original Indians or white Spanish Indians, they've been consistently excluding black folk for 140 years using a quantum of blood. And there's nothing in those treaties that say that. It says the descendants of black freemen and black Indians entitled in respect and appreciation and compensation for the rest of their lives to everybody else. That is called the 1866 Indian Treaties, uh, which, are not, which was put on the civilized tribes, and they became civilized because they fought with the South. But what the Indians didn't know when they fought with the South was that they lost their benefits because what happened to the, the United States government still gave them to them because they were in a protected class. But in every treaty from, from the start in the 1500s, it says that you cannot take up arms against the United States. And those Indians signed with the South to fight with the South to maintain slavery, they took up arms, they lost their, their benefits. And that's why, that's why they lost all that land out west. And whites then put them, put them on reservations and gave them amnesty and put them on reservations and took all the land and set it up for, 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 um, for Europeans coming to the country to kind of land rush, to pick up land. Like in Oklahoma, in a one day period, that, they, that, that whites picked up over two million acres of land in one day in a land rush. But again, black folks were denied then, they're still being denied. So we need support from every black. It's a political issue. Start getting on every black elected official, every civil rights organization, and every minister in church. And tell them you need to go out here and start raising cane to get some benefits for black folk under, this, under these 1866 treaties. And that's the trouble we're having right now in the, in the courts. Because everybody says this is not a legal issue, it's a political issue. You blacks don't have enough political clout, enough political leadership to demand the rights for these people. Okay. All right. Excellent. Excellent, brother. Now, uh, we're coming up on a commercial break. When we, when we come back from the break, what I want to what I want you to um, to explain to us is where where can people go to learn more about this treaty and, and give us some strategies on how we can push this to our elected officials, things like that, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, so, you know, and, and I've been reading about this, brother, and, and also what I did as well, I think we may be able to tie this to House Resolution 194, July 29, 2008, where the U.S. House of Representatives formally apologized for 246 years of slavery and decades of Jim Crow segregation. Well, yeah, you can do that, but don't tie, it, don't tie it to John Cunningham's bill, though. Don't tie it to that. Okay. So okay. that doesn't make any sense at all. Okay. You come back, we'll talk about it. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> because right now, black folks entitled to billions upon billions of dollars that never got a penny. Let's talk about that to get back. From okay. The okay. <laughs> Okay, you listen to the Dr. Claude Anderson show on the you listen to the Michael M. Hotep show on the Palmer Radio Network where knowledge is power. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the Michael M. Hotep show on the Empowerment Radio Network where knowledge is power. If you're just tuning in, we're speaking with Dr. Claude Anderson, author of Black Label White Wealth and Powernomics, and he is educating us on the Black Freedmen Indian Treaty of 1866 and You've listened to the show before. You've heard me talk about that before as well. All right, now, uh, Dr. Anderson, I just want I want to back up uh, a minute here uh, because when I brought you back from the first break, they had the mic volume down a little bit. Uh, I just want to recap: um, when the Civil War ended, the Choctaw and the Chickasaw they still owned twelve thousand to fifteen thousand black slaves. Was, was that right? Right. right. In, 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 mm -hmm. Each. Each. One. Yeah. 
that, that, that was uh, all together. Just those two sides alone still had about 27,000 blacks and slaves. Wow, wow. Now, I know you talk about the five civilized tribes, the Choctaw, Chickasaw, the Creek, the Cherokee, and the Seminole Indians, and, and, uh -huh. and that's who is designated in that Black Freedmen Indian Treaty of 1866. Now, there were over at least, maybe there were at least about 500 um, Indian, quote unquote, Indian nations, uh, from my understanding and my research, th did did other ones before these five, be besides these five civilized tribes, did they also, the other ones also own black slaves as well? Uh, probably proportionally, but uh, and and, and uh, based on the size of the tribes, but the uh, but all the treaties, almost every treaty uh, stipulated how the, how they were to be treated and how to treat black folks and got rewards and incentives for doing it. Mm. Uh, and 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 that that was a big factor. Okay. For instance, the uh, every every tribe that could claim that was helping assisting in uh in, in maintaining slavery for black folk, they yes. got they got everything from my friends. They got a they got uh they got uh, clothes. They got weapons. They got food. Uh, they were classified as being a uh, 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 uh you know free of being enslaved, and uh, and they also are rewarded in in many ways. Uh, and, and compensated for it, like for, for runaway slaves that got paid for it, right. and and uh, and and most importantly, they were classified then as quasi-white. Right. Go back and read all your documents. That's what Thomas Jefferson always talks about: is that that those that Indians were just their were their blood cousins. That's why that's why whites love to claim they got Indian blood. They were just quasi-white. All they wanted to do was to be civilized. They'd be totally acceptable to society. But black folk were just the opposite. Black folk were, were, were to be aborted, that blood was to be aborted at all costs. Mm -hmm. And whites and their ethos and their mindset then began to elevate uh, Indian blood as being some kind of special blood. you got Indian blood in you. And the only blood I'm aware of that should have been sacred was Jesus Christ's blood. But they began to elevate Indian blood. At the same time, disparage anything dealing with black folk. But they did get weapons, clothes, foods, household goods. They were placed in a protected class. They were classified as a sovereign nation. They were, they were ruled exempt from slavery. Right. And they were classified as being uh, quasi-white, even to the present time. Wow, wow. And, and, I, and I've, I've read your books. You talk about some of that in Dirty Little Secrets, Volume 1. I've read the information on the uh, Black Freedom Indian Treaty on your website and also have, have your DVD on that as well. Um, okay, now before the break, I was, I was asking you, how do we connect this, the Black Freedom Indian Treaty of 1866 and pushing for that uh, to be enforced for black people? How do we connect that? Uh, to the uh, official apology that the U.S. House of Representatives did for 246 years of child slavery, decades of Jim Crow segregation, is House Resolution 194. I don't, I don't think that has anything to do with John Conyers, and I, <laughs> I, I emailed that to, to your uh, to your wife also for you to uh, okay. For you to check well, that out. well, it's very simple. First mm -hmm. thing we can do is understand it's a political, it's a political issue, not a, not a legal issue. Okay. And we go into the courts issue. that the courts are. And we've been I'm in I'm in the courts now, spending over hundred thousand dollars fighting this battle. Uh, but they, they keep coming up with miniature excuses. They keep, we crawl an inch, but they fight every inch to give in. At first they were saying, well, the Indian Treaty is not valid for black folks. Then we sit in the but did, and then we say, why, why are you enforcing it for whites when they both were the same treaty? When they finally lost that battle, they come up with another, well, you had a, you had a statute of limitation that black folks were supposed to raise cane about being excluded by the year 1907 when the account system was set up. And I said, that's, that's humanly impossible when blacks are coming out of slavery. And you're lynching two black people day in the United States in 1907. How in the world blacks are going to the court and demand justice? Right. And so anyway, we fought our way up to the, to the present time over, you know, all, the, over you know, all these years, a lot of money. But what, what you need to do is put pressure on all your elected officials, start with the United States Congress, okay. and mandate that they get together and, put, and draft a bill. Or if, as a matter of fact, any senator, if we, had, we had one black senator in Chicago, we asked him to do it. He was so scared, petrified, he would, all he had to do was just submit a, 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 a statement to the United States Senate saying that black folk entitled these kind of benefits to be included. But, but, so you have to put, it has to be a political issue. If you're going to demonstrate, hit the streets, go out now and start demanding reparations, this is a form of reparations, repairs, but, uh, in a sense, and following and obeying the mandates of the 1866 Indian Treaty. And that would kick the door open wide because we got a list of maybe 200 some thousand Blacks on our dog rolls right now, they're entitled to benefits. And once those black folks get those benefits, they understand that then they can start building casinos, they can start getting these resources, they can start getting radio stations, TV stations, and licenses. They can go, they can go to an electric company and get contracts for electric, for having electric grids and stuff like that. And, uh, 
but black folk have to organize and start playing as a team to start demanding benefits. And uh, I think, Earl, you want to talk about the politics. We'll get right. to that, how blacks must start demanding these benefits. And no more social integration, no more civil rights. <laughs> these things don't have a better thing to do with no civil rights and social integration. Though those, those concepts and terms are simply designed to misdirect black folk away from the real problems, which is the fact that the, that the structural in, uh, inequalities put in place by centuries of slavery and Jim Crow segregation has never been corrected. It's economics. We have no wealth and no power. We don't control anything that's important and valuable that's more than 1% to, to one percent. You don't have anything. You cannot compete in a society owning, controlling absolutely nothing. Absolutely. Now, you said that uh, there were that there are approximately 200,000 blacks on the Dolls Rolls right now. Was it 200,000 that you said? Yeah, we got we got about 200,000 that we can try to already identify. Mm. But, you got, but, but you got a whole bunch of other blacks who uh who it's, it's, it's that's just on the dolls road yes but those treaties say any black freeman who are living in the ter in indian territory at the time those it, up to that time those treaties were signed were entitled to these benefits to be included hmm. okay uh, and, and you're talking about billions and billions of dollars i'm not talking about chicken change right. we have a lot of blacks going around talking about well we're going to we're going to we're going we're gonna to try to get reparations we're going to ask how you're going to do it. Well, we're going to go, uh, it, it was immoral and illegal, and, and then they, they beat my dad and took our land. No, no. If you can't quit appealing to white people's conscience for something that's a law, just right. see, all we want them to do is, is enforce fairly the law. Exactly. Don't be hating whites. Don't hate anybody. Don't Just go there and say, hey, we're not against anybody. We're not against whites or anyone else. We just want a fair and, and applicable enforcement of the 1866 Indian treaties that should be including black freedmen and black Indians and the descendants of black freedmen and black Indians, just like you're doing for the white Indians and the, and the so-called original Indians. Right. And that's what they do. They're only taking care of one side of the street and not taking care of the other side. Exactly. Now, before people go out and tell their elected officials they should enforce this and things like that, personally, I think they should educate themselves on the treaty first so they know what they're talking about. So you're absolutely right. So, see, and you, see, you, see, you're a smart man. You're the head of the curve. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> see, you've already read those things. And, 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 and if you go to the website and then about our newsletter, yeah. uh, that, that I have, matter of fact, there's one uh, DVD we have out yes. that, that explains the end for treaties. And they can get these, they can get these DVDs that are taken through every step, show them all the benefits, how, and the dates and times and places when the whole thing started back in the 1500s. All the way up to the present time, breaks down everything for them. Okay. They can go to the harvest. I mean, they can go to powernomics. dot com and order and order the tapes and uh, and and then get the and ask for the 1866 Indian Treaty. It covers all this for them. Exactly. As a matter of fact, I thought you were down in a down in Atlanta, Georgia. I got to be in Atlanta, Georgia this weekend, speaking over at the Omni Tech School on Saturday at 12 o'clock. And I and I want all those blacks in Atlanta, Georgia, to come out to Omni Tech. Uh, at, at 12 o'clock this coming Saturday, and uh, I'll maybe be talking about some of these things for them. That's Undertech. I'm not sure the address. Okay. Uh, let me see. Now, hold on one second. Okay. But, but yeah. That address is uh, it'll be on Saturday, November 8th at 12 o'clock noon. At 12 o'clock noon. Okay, and that's located at 1800 Phoenix Boulevard in Atlanta, Georgia. It's called the Undertech Institute. That's one of the best black trade schools in the entire United States. And, um, and he's fighting the side survival. They've been trying to put him out of business down there, competitors from outside the community. Mm, but it's, uh, that's November 8th at 12 o'clock noon. Okay, that's and that exactly. address is 1800 Phoenix Boulevard in Atlanta, Georgia, and it's the Omni Tech Institute. Okay, and I know uh, Dave Anderson, owner of the Empowerment Radio Network, he's in Atlanta. So uh, maybe he can get there. I don't know what his schedule is. I have to check with him. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, if your wife can email me the flyer or email me that information, I'll announce it each day here on the show. Okay. Michael, you're a good guy. Oh. Gladly, hey, gladly God made that many. <laughs> no problem. Stand by. We have to take a quick break. You're listening to the Michael M. Hotep Show on the Empowerment Radio Network, where knowledge is power. We'll be back in a few minutes. Palmer Radio Network with Knowledge is Power. All right, we're having a fantastic discussion with our brother, uh, Dr. Claude Anderson, who's given us some powerful knowledge. Once again, visit his website, powernomics.com, powernomics.com. The uh, DVD presentation 
that he was talking about that explains the Black Indian Treaty is uh, eight, it's called 1860, 1866 Indian Treaties Benefits Do Black Americans. 1866 Indian Treaties Benefits Do Black Americans. He has other DVDs as well. And also check out his books, Powernomics, which explains all this information and is a, and is a, uh, a economic empowerment plan for black America as well as black label white wealth. Black label white wealth deals with about 1,300 years of history and lays out this history and uh, then Powernomics is the actual national plan for black America. All right, now, uh, Dr. Anderson, once people digest the information, once black people digest the information of the Black Freedmen Indian Treaty of 1866 and understand what it is, then how should they engage our elected officials that we elected to do something for us in exchange for our vote? How should, how should we engage that? How should we engage that? Uh, that, that's a good question. What I would do is, is, is a contact, ask them all to mobilize and organize a, a collective movement to, to get every civil rights organization, every church, every black elected official, uh, and, and, and demand that they understand the nature of the trees and its benefits to black America, and, then, and, uh, and challenge them to go out there and do, and start an act of beginning, uh, going to television stations, radio stations, newsprint, write letters, uh, uh, doing anything they can, mobilize them. They would, since most of them like to march, let them march and march with some rep some forms of, uh, recompense for black folk. And, uh, then secondly, I would then to every candidate that's running for an office, I don't care whether he's black or white, you tell them that if they want to run for an office, they want the black vote, they must come into your community and come into a common center with blacks there and, and sign some kind of a con contract that they're going to support this issue for reparations, make a, make a commitment. And you base it on power economics principles from this day forward after like, like, just like yesterday's election. You tell, start so telling blacks across America, but start telling every political party, every ideological group, and every political candidate that no more, the day is over, that from now on we will not support any candidate, or any political party that would not support us in our issues and our, and our needs. Mm -hmm. And start demanding that. And they come in there, they, if they want to, if they want your vote, it must be based on the basic premise of politics which is quid pro quo, something for something. One hand washes the other. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Do not vote for any candidates, black, white, pink, or polka dot, that would not commit them to doing something to help black folk. Black folk are in a desperate situation in the United States right now. And we get we have permanent underclass to get ready to get wiped out. We have to start demanding resources. And what we want are not anything, nothing symbolic. We want tangible benefits coming to the black community, not coming to everybody. And many of these civil rights organizations or politicians start telling you he's running for an office and he's going to take care of everybody. Mm -hmm. You walk away from him and run him out of your community. You, you, right now, black folk need specific things addressed specifically to them based on their unique needs and start demanding that everybody understand in society that black people are exceptions. We are, we talk about American exceptionality. The only thing that's American that's an exception is black folk. We are not to be grouped with minorities and poor folk and people of color. We're distinctively different from all those groups. None of those groups have been enslaved, Jim Crow segregated, denied, neglected for 500 years. Only black folk have. And the greatest insult that you can do to black folk is that all of a sudden, by putting black folk in these broad categories, calling them minorities, poor folk, and people of color, which nobody knows what a minority is and what people of color is. And so, and you create an injustice by pretending to it, by using those broad words, that somehow black folk have not been treated any different than anyone else. And, then you, and also you suggest, by using those words, that everybody, every group has contributed equally to the development of this country, and that's a lie. If they have not. Black folk were the major backbones of economic development in this country, and black folk need to come out front and start demanding and say, we were the, were the major producers of resources in this country for all these years, and we, and we are an exception of people, and we want to stop this 1866 Indian Treaty, because we're not appealing to your conscience or your goodwill. We're appealing to you to enforce the mandated treaties and laws in this country. Just like you've been taking care of American Indians, giving them no taxes, no, no tuition, nothing, and all these resources and reservations for 140 years, you've got to start doing it for black folk, too. Excellent, excellent. Now, let me ask you this. We have a few minutes left, and I, I know you're very busy. I know you have to run, so we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us. Um, should we use, because this treaty is law, should we use the term reparations when pushing for this? Because the reason why I say that is because reparations uh, automatically causes people to recoil. 
So should we avoid using that term and just focus on the Black Freedom and Indian Treaty because it is law, or should we use the term reparations along with this? No, I, you don't even have to use the term reparations. Okay. I just use that loosely okay, so good. because reparations meant repairing something. Yeah, yeah, okay. And, uh, so, uh, and, I, and that's also the same time I use that word repair, I said recompense. You mentioned you're, you're compensating yes. for what you've denied them for 140 years. But yes. black folks, what you're going to ask demand that they is that they equally enforce the law in the man in those treaties and go back and, and identify and set up a special unit. And that's why the Harvest Institute now is a is a Department of the Institute Freedmen Federation is the one that filed the lawsuits in the federal courts, in the federal uh, small claims court, in the appeals court, in the Sixth Circuit court, and in, for the Supreme Court. We have been filing those claims saying that we want you to enforce these treaties and provide some benefits. Black folk cannot compete in this country right now. And they're bringing in all these immigrants over black folk, plan on right. making black a permanent underclass and burying them beneath an unending influx of immigrants in this country. Hispanics in the year 2000 pushed blacks out of being second-class citizens and made them third-class citizens. And as I prophesied in my books that by the year 2013, that it became, it became the official underclass in the country. And underclass means those individuals by the nature of their social economic conditions are going to be we have little recourse but to function as either criminals or beggars for the rest of their existence we got to get an economic base we have got to develop an alternative economic system and build businesses and industries in this country where black folk can hire their own people produce services goods and products and then job opportunities and employment opportunities for, for the young people in their own communities and hire their own people and be able to set up a tax base this must happen. We got to start on it immediately, and uh, so we start with those. But the resources coming out of Indian treaties, we're going to start, and, and everybody's going to rally around those people that are entitled to these benefits, and we're going to all set up a collective industry through the Harvest Institute, and that's why we're looking for money to keep supporting the Harvest Institute. You can go to www.harvestinstitute.org on your website and make contributions. Right now, we're trying to raise enough funds to keep staying in the courts. This is the only thing that hope the blacks got right now. Nobody's going to give black folk anything right now on an emotional basis. Absolutely. This is a law. Go on, go to www.harvestinstitute.org and make contributions, donations, so we can pay these legal fees and all the cost, court costs, filings, and all those things. And demand that every go on every radio station, TV station, every day, and raise canes so that you're going to have to you're going to have to enforce these laws equally and fairly. And as a white congressman has told me, this, as I said, a number of them have, so Dr. Anthony, you're absolutely right. The fact that you're not getting any benefits, you all have never gotten benefits, is because your elected officials, your civil rights leaders, have never, ever tried to make an issue out of benefits going to black folk. They don't, they don't demand anything, and they don't, that's why they never get anything. Right, so so when we're dealing with elected officials, now we just had elections yesterday, but even now, when we deal with those elected officials that we have, whether whether they're black, whether they're white, what have you, they still are supposed to represent you. So these are issues, this is one of the main issues that we should be pushing and raising hell about on this, uh, the city council, mayor, uh, state representatives, uh, U.S. House of Representatives, U.S. Senate. Okay, these are issues that we should be pushing, and this w this goes all the way to the White House. Is that correct? Uh, Dr. That's right. That's right. And, and you tell them you understand the game now. The game is that so you have to understand the game. That, that that based on the United States Constitution, of 1790, we were made a permanent underclass. Mm -hmm. I think of, uh, as a, when you call use the word minority, we've been outnumbered eight to one for over 400 some years. Eight to one. If you live in a society. Uh, where, where the, the majority will win and the minority will lose. Eight whites outnumber blacks, eight to one. Eight will go over one, eight times with nothing left over. Hispanics have now increased and passed us, now we outnumber nine to one. If I throw a rabbit into a, into a, into a cage with, with nine hungry bulldogs, they're gonna vote on what they're gonna have for lunch. Who cares what the rabbit thinks? Because he's at lunch. And the black folks vote right now means nothing unless blacks learn how to play politics to win. When you play politics to win, Every black person, as of yesterday's vote, should pull, away, pull out the Democratic Party, pull out the Republican Party, and build a black independent party across America. Yes. Where for all 42 million blacks should say, we're going to vote as a bloc, and we're going to vote based on our group's self-interest. We're not getting anything anyway. So we'll vote for a bloc, and we'll, vote, we'll only vote for those individuals or those political parties who will support black people and do things special for black folk exceptionality. And if they don't do it, so I'm not come looking for our vote.
Exactly. And you vote as a block. And once you, once, once they find out you're going to vote as a block, every politician will come courting you, trying to get that block vote of 42 million votes. They'll need you then. It's just like if you, if you got a pretty woman, and she's a person in the neighborhood, she's attractive and well-educated, and she doesn't belong to anybody, everybody will come looking for her. Right now, the political parties in this country take black folk for granted. They don't care about you because you don't demand anything. They don't give you anything. And don't let people tell you about, well, we got to go out and exercise our right to vote mm -hmm. because black folks, uh, they exercise. No, if you don't exercise, go to the gym, jog at the park. Right. You, okay. Don't go, you don't go to the, you don't go to a voting booth to get exercise, you go there to get benefits. Exactly. Okay, okay we're out of time, brother. Uh, all right. Visit his website, powernomics.com, harvestinstitute.org. Support this brother. I, I support him also. We're going to have to have you back again very, very soon, brother. Cause well, okay, Mike. I thank you, Mike, for inviting me this time. And I hope I wasn't talking too fast. No, no. Just to get in my information. Hope I didn't overrun my time. No, you're all right. Okay, no problem. You have a good day and tell your wife I said hello also, okay? Okay, you have a good day too, buddy. Thanks. And don't forget about mentioning things about uh, the Undertech Institute this coming Saturday at, tw uh, at 12 o'clock. I got you. All thank right. you, buddy. No all right, bye bye. You listen to the Michael M. Hotep Show on the Empowerment Radio Network where knowledge is power. We'll be back in a few minutes. Remember, this show repeats tonight, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.